So hello everyone, welcome to this week's YouTube tutorial. I'm Mike Ingledew. I'm all about making you successful with your integrated product support strategies, whether that's standard, specifications, selecting software, or just improving your skills. That's what we're all about on this channel. So this week I want to talk about something that's come up a lot over the last few weeks for me and uh, where I'm spending a lot of time answering questions is that of the S1000D process data module. And uh, the questions that I get quite frequently around this is, can you just tell us a little bit more about the role of the process data module? And we, of course, can go a little bit more complex into how do we actually create it? How do we deploy it? How do we use it? So today we're going to kick off looking at the process data module with a little bit of background on what it is and why we can use it. And then over the coming weeks, we're going to look at how can we actually initiate it and how can we actually deploy it? which is uh, kind of really a little bit more important. There's no sense investing all this time, energy and money into something like a process data module and um, we can't actually use it, deploy it or um, our software doesn't support it. So today we are going to talk a little bit about the process data module. And again, thank you to everybody who has sent in questions around this. Uh, I have forwarded and um, shared with you some white papers and some resources uh, if you want access to things like white papers and additional information about the process data module uh, from a practical level on how you can actually use this and, and maximize the, uh, the impact of your technical documentation, let me know, get in touch and I'll be more than happy to send you a link to a paper that I, I co-wrote with a company. So uh, today we're going to look at the process data module. And we have to think about how much time could we save if we actually give uh, good quality technical publications to our end user. And, you know, we've talked a lot on this channel already about things like CBM, CBM Plus, the integrated platform, uh, those kind of things. This is where we can start making that all a reality. This is where we can make it something that actually is going to deliver some real value from modern technical information deployments and how we can actually uh, take our S1000D content and take it, I hate this saying, take it to the next level. And how can we actually turn it into something that delivers real value? And I can't share any details just yet, but I have been told by one organization uh, the, the number that they believe they are saving in terms of maintenance time with using the process data module and I've asked if we can co-author a white paper on it and hopefully that is something we can do but let me tell you it's not insignificant and it ties in nicely to all of the stuff I've talked about over the last few weeks ROI where do we get the ROI in S1000D in quality documentation and if we now take it to the next level with something like the process data module, uh, we can really uh, start seeing real maintenance uh, times being saved over the life of our platform. So we're going to talk about how much time could we save over the coming weeks. And um, but we're going to talk about the process data module. And it really is where the tech doc it, it meets programming. So this is there's there's lots of reasons why pro, uh, projects or technical publications departments or even software companies avoid the process data module. And it really is because the tech doc here now is meeting the uh, the programming side. We have to have a logic mind about how it works. And, you know, we've been doing logic flows for a very, very long time. You know, here, for example, I'm going to come on to this later on. This is Microsoft uh, Visio, and I've just been laying out some um, some modules and how I want the interaction and the logic to work between them. And I'm going to talk about how I use things like Visio very, very shortly. Um, but, you know, we've been doing fault diagnosis type trees and all that kind of stuff forever in our technical documents. So but now we can actually maximize screen real estate if we're going out to things like IETPs and we can uh, remove the need for a user to be able to scroll through pages of maybe a flow diagram or something along those lines 
and we can actually present information at each stage of a process. It will all become clear as we go through it, but I'm going to talk about that more now. So it really is where the tech doc meets uh, programming and the process data module really helps us guide our users through processes as the name explains and we are taking that flow that process flow that we've done forever and we're now turning it into something called the process data module which guides us through each individual steps now there's many ways that we can work with the process data module i'm giving you some uh, examples here today on how that could work so the process data module is a method for programmatically guiding a user through steps processes or information and you know i'm going to talk about some use cases here very very shortly um, it's a it's a method for us of grouping activities and logic processes or log logic steps uh, we can maximize that screen real estate which is which is key for us if we are going out um, i've just asked the the budget holder here at tdw if i can order a fold out screen um, which are now in the next generation we talked about that a couple of weeks ago so we you know you can imagine that we have to we don't want to keep taking users away from the content the process that they are in at the moment the process data module allows us to keep them in one centralized location and present the information to them that we want them uh, to have and it simplifies uh, the complex fault tree presentations and what i mean by that is traditionally in technical documentation we might create flow diagrams or fault process trees or something along those lines where the user would follow flick through maybe have to jump to different chapters jump different pages maybe a different fault tree we can actually streamline that process and actually have the software do all of the heavy lifting all of that metaphorical page turning for us so we don't have to have the user do that and of course this means we have to have a little bit of programmatic knowledge and we can trigger the process data module either manually or automatically and i've talked about that before and i've written some papers on this and again if you want those get in touch with us is that you know we we can trigger the process data module from things like a fault code for example or some kind of value that's sent from an external system that then triggers the IETP and sets us off down a maintenance task or a fault finding task or something along those lines or we can just do it manumatically we give it to the user in isolation within the IETP the IETP asks for a value and they pop it into the IETP and the IETP decides where they're going to go and you know so but we're going to talk more about uh, initiating and triggering process data modules and deploying process data modules over the coming weeks and if you want to learn more about that give me a thumbs up and i'll let you know uh, when that is actually going to happen so what are the benefits when it comes to working with our process data modules why do we use them so well it's an efficient and appropriate uh, data presentation methodology to the user at the time that they require it based on parameters based on system inputs based on whatever situation they are in and based on what the product or the platform is telling them we can give them that information at the right time no more page turning no more flipping around uh, trying to find that content we can give it to them at the point of need and based on a, a number of different parameters and inputs and we can move away from that traditional navigation process that i just talked about so we can present it um, in the way that the user needs to use it based on screen real estate based on uh, how the uh, the ietp requires it to be presented now i'm not going to show you any ietps right now if you want to see more ietps with process data modules in link down below you can go and check some of those guys out because some of them uh, support the process data module some don't support the process data module and they present them slightly differently and you have to decide which one works for you and for your uh, users 
We can integrate with external systems. So we, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we can uh, trigger the process data module based on maybe some kind of bit test uh, result or maybe some kind of fault code that comes directly off the platform or, um, you know, something along those lines. We can just actually trigger the content dy dynamically from an external system. And also, we'll talk about it uh, very shortly, we can push information from the process data module to external systems for other reasons, which uh, helps us as well, which is nicely takes us into capturing metrics in the background. And I'm going to I've got a slide on where and how that might work and how we could use it work. But, you know, we're moving more into the IoT. We're moving more into the connected platform. We're moving more into data analytics. We're moving more into is the product doing what we said it was going to do and how we said it was going to do it. So we can capture metrics from the IETP that the user doesn't necessarily care about. But from a product owner's perspective or from maybe a uh, procurement perspective or provisioning perspective, we might want to track what we're ordering, when we're ordering it, how often are we ordering it, uh, those kind of things. So we can actually push metrics out of the IETP and we can automate processes, maintenance processes, for example, parts ordering because we are using XML. Because we are identifying parts information with those XML structures, the process data module and the software can identify any spares or parts that might be required and can trigger parts ordering processes. Which means that if we automate, and again, I've done webinars on this, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much, is that if we trigger a fault code, the fault code triggers the IETP. The IETP can then say, oh, OK, for this, I know I'm going to need these tools. I'm going to need this specialist skill. And I know that I'm going to need uh, the actual uh, spares that we might need or any consumables that we might need. And it can create a job card. Loads of webinars have been done on that. And uh, so you can check those out on our website. But we can uh, automate processes. But it's also important to remember that we can use it for training, not just tech docs deployment. So it's actually a great methodology. Something that we are looking at right now is how can we turn our existing training material that we have here at S1 at, at uh, TDW for our S1000D training, and how can we uh, turn that into a process data module that we can deploy and we can work students through specific um, uh, tasks and they uh, on our authoring. Ta uh, course, for example, how can they, they they produce a piece of XML structure? Have you done it? Yes. OK, now test it. Has it worked? No. OK, go back. Let's re recreate it again. So it's not just a technical publications uh, tool, if you like. We could use it for training as well. And uh, many organizations are. So if the process data module delivers so much value and so much power, uh, why do many projects run away from it? And uh, at this point, I was going to do a Monty Python, um, the Knights of Knee run away kind of impression. But I think I'll, I'll spare you that is that, you know, many uh, tech pubs guys. In fact, only recently I've answered a question uh, from an organization that, and they've just gone. That's too complex for us. We're not actually going to bother with that. And so why is it many of our technical publications guys run away from it. Well, as I've mentioned already, it requires programming knowledge. I've already talked about um, some functions and that of the process data module today, which is more programmatic speak. I'm not a software programmer. I know enough to uh, cause damage, but uh, I'm not a hardcore software programmer, but I can talk uh, two programmers in a way that I think I understand what they're saying. So the uh, it re does require programming uh, knowledge. Not all software tools support the process data module. I have seen projects actually actively being discouraged from adopting the process data module because the software vendor has said that it's not something you should be using when it actually turns out the software vendor doesn't support it, which is not the reason you should be uh, deciding that the process data module is not for you. 
And uh, so we have to be sure that our software tools can uh, support it. Uh, project budget does not allow for the time uh, to create it. You know, it takes time to design a, uh, a process data module, as I've mentioned already. Here is a, uh, a, a tree, a bolt tree that, uh, that I've created in uh, Visio and it takes time to design and you need to have that, that mindset to be able to walk people through a specific process and what you want from that and what you want to achieve from that process. Uh, so many people just find it uh, too cumbersome, just easier to create an illustration with a flowchart in it and bang it inside the tech pub. And um, it's just too hard. So like I say, people will just use this methodology and uh, just say, look, give it to the illustrator and the illustrator will go and try and turn that into something that is a little bit more coherent and something that we can just uh, put inside a technical publication, which is fine if that's what your project wants and if that's what your project needs and that's what your project uh, actually can afford. Uh, but there are better ways. So let's have a look at a, a specific scenario. And anybody who has been on my uh, training courses, my authoring training courses or anything along those lines, you've got the TDW flashlight or torch, if you prefer, uh, behind me here. And we do break this down and we look at some of the provisioning information around this. And then we talk about creating parts information in the IPDs, uh, etc. So let's look at uh, maybe a specific scenario around our flashlight. And if I've, I've just done a very basic one here for, uh, for YouTube, and we've just said here that uh, the unit's not functioning, so i.e. it's not actually emitting any light, and therefore we need to go through a process. I appreciate that this is very basic. I'm teaching you the principles here. I'm not teaching you how to get into the nitty gritty and the dirty of creating the XML. So here we have our product and I've just basically identified it here. I'm not a technical illustrator by trade, so photos work for me. And um, so here we have a flow and we have a start and we have an end point. We know that, and that's with all of our procedures, we have a start point and we have an end point and everything in between are the steps and the processes that we want our user to go through. And so we are going to talk and guide our user through doing some tests and some procedures to find out why this light is no longer emitting. And uh, so we want to talk them through some procedures. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask them if the actual uh, filter housing has been removed. And But before we get to that, we want to make sure that they have read all of the safety instructions for our system or for our product or for wherever uh, we want them to go. So what's happened here is we can take some preliminary information and we can drive the user first and foremost to safety information. Then we want to ask them if the, uh, the filter housing has been removed and if it's yes, uh, then we can move down the, the, the process. If no, we can talk them how to or talk them through removing the filter housing before uh, it's ready to um, be having the first process, if you like, actually applied to it. Then we're going to talk them through uh, a power check. So I know that I've I've over egged this a little bit. This has got batteries in it, but here we're talking about power units, power packs, or whatever that might be in here, just to fluff it up a little bit. And we're gonna talk them through a, uh, a power check. And again, we're gonna talk them through some safety information. Uh, we're gonna talk about a removal and examining uh, procedures that we want them to do. And then we're gonna ask them, have they found any damage? And at this point, we could say, what kind of damage have you found? And if we wanted to, if it was corrosion, we could tell them what they needed to do to, to rectify it. If it was leakage, what do we need them to do? Any additional safety information we need them to go to, we can uh, talk them through, their, through that. And here we can then talk them, if they found this problem, then we can tell them how to replace uh, the power pack. And then we want to talk them through how to do a power test or a power unit test, uh, some kind of functional test. 
and we can ask them did it pass uh, and if it passed yes we can carry on through the process if no then we can loop them so now we're starting to talk a little bit more uh, programmatically we can loop them back to the initial task of doing a, maybe another examination or maybe another test if we wanted to i'm going to come back to this loop uh, towards the end of this tutorial because there's some things you need to watch out for here so we can uh, actually reinstall the pack we can perform a functional test when it's been uh, re reinstalled and then we can ask the question has uh, the the light started to illuminate and we can say if it's yes we want to uh, refit the housing that's uh, at the front end here and you can see that I've done all of this inside Visio planned it out in Visio and uh, I've just turned it into a slide over here and we can ask the the um, user to refit the unit as is ready to go back into service and essentially that would take us pretty much uh, towards the end of our task but what happens now if the unit is still not functioning uh, correctly so now we can start going through some light element checks and I'm not going to go through each of these uh, in turn and we you can see that we're talking them through lots of modules now if we're talking this in a traditional sense, we'd be talking them in an S1000D sense, in an IETP, we might be taking them away from the actual task that we're trying to do. This could be a checklist, it could be something along those lines, a fault tree, and we're driving them away. A couple of weeks ago, I did one on, you know, sensible modularization. Well, this means is that we can modularize how we like because we can centralize all of that content within inside a process data module, within inside the IETP, and we can keep them in one centralized location and just talk them through each step, regardless of whether they are all in different data modules, depending on how your IETP is deploying and presenting this information. So again, here we've gone through a um, another set of tests because uh, it's still not working, even though we've done a power pack check. And now here we, we've said, look, if there's a fault found, Yes, we need to order a new piece, no fault found. Uh, we can put it back into the uh, into the unit and we can uh, then do some additional tests. And does the uh, does it now illuminate? Yes. Now we can take them back to that same task of refitting the uh, the filter unit at the front end. So we go refit the filter unit and um, but if no, we're now going to move into a separate task of doing some functional tests and some examinations on the switch unit itself. And again, more safety information because we're now looking at electronics or electrical parts and we might need them to uh, go and have a look at some safety information. Talk them through some uh, examinations. Is it still not working? OK, the unit is unserviceable. And what do we want to do with this now? Return it back under warranty or are we returning it or are we disposing of it? Whatever we need to do with this particular unit. Has the fault uh, still been identified? Yes, we can order a new part, fit a new switch, uh, carry out a, uh, a functional test. Uh, does the does it illuminate now we've gone through each three of these stages we've done a power pack check we've done an element check um, and now we've done a switch check uh, and it's still not working okay it's it's buggered we need to send it back to uh, whoever can fix it or we need to dispose of it correctly uh, if it works we close the loop and it has now uh, passed all of its tests and we can return the, the flashlight or the torch, whichever you prefer, back to service. So you can see that what we did there, and I'm going to talk about what's happening on that flow chart very shortly uh, in terms of the, what the process data module is doing. But you can see that uh, it's highly functional. This information, as we've just talked them through, only this is a very basic uh, fault finding task that we're asking the user to do. And you can see that there's lots of information that we would have to, in a traditional sense, on paper, we would be flicking to and fro and doing lots of different things. In an IETP, if we're not using the process data module, would take us all over the place. 
So what's actually going on on here? So we have the actual uh, process itself. I'm not going to build this through again. And what's actually going on on here? So we have lots of preliminary information. So we've taken them to and I've not called out tools and I've not called out spares and those kind of things in the preliminary information or skills or anything along those lines. What we're saying here is that there's some safety information that you need to go and do. Uh, you know, there could be make the equipment safe uh, for for maintenance or whatever your processes require. There's three main tasks here with lots of subtasks. So lots of little things going on, lots of other data modules that we might be referring to. And there's some parts ordering stuff going on here. And as I've said now, is there are logic loops. And again, we do it. This is traditional tech pubs. We're not uh, reinventing the wheel here. We are just programmatically uh, using what we've done for a very, very long time. So, but all of that stuff that I mentioned at the beginning is how can we now really, I'm going to use the leverage word. So those of you who have a meltdown, please do so now, is that we can really now leverage that content further and we can take it that stage further using the process data module. So going further with our uh, PDM, our process data module, is that here we can have the uh, the ability to identify areas on the slide here. So we have parts ordering information. We have the green area, which is capturing metrics and feedback. And the final area here is uh, the track number of un unserviceable units. So what's actually happening uh, on the slide here? So if I illuminate here, we have parts ordering and tracking going on uh, at different stages of this particular flow. And this could be automatic interrogation of an IPD data module. It could be automatic ordering. It could be anything along those lines. In the green area, we could be capturing metrics and feeding this information back to, uh, to monitoring systems or to analytic systems or in the future AI systems, which is going to be monitoring this across the entire fleet of our platforms, our maintainers, our products, our processes, uh, whatever we're going to do. You know, we might have, you know, 10,000s of these uh, units in service and we can track all of that metrics. And finally, uh, tracking the number of unserviceable units is something that we could be doing. And we can uh, track those again in external systems. We can identify serial numbers, all these kind of things and monitor them uh, throughout the life of a platform. So all the stuff that we couldn't do traditionally without, in my day, swinging the lantern, uh, we used to fill out forms with serial numbers and then somebody would manu manually take that information from the forms. And you can imagine this poor uh, lady or guy sat at a desk uh, getting hundreds of these forms in from hundreds of users having to manually uh, do all of the analytics. We can feed all of this now into systems that will do all of that for us from the content, from the process module and um, really drive the content in a way that we've not been able to drive the content in the past. So I've mentioned that, uh, you know, defining the process data module, uh, for me, it's much easier to use tools like Visio. And uh, so I can visualize the uh, the process the flow and it's much easier for me to then take that and um, explain it to whoever I need to explain it to have us have one of my peers review it and say this is the process what do you think and then what we can do is either program the the or write the process data module ourselves or give it to somebody who could do it in a much more efficient and timely manner so I visualize first uh, before I do anything and whether that's on a whiteboard for you guys or whatever it is. But when we uh, define our process data module, we have to be aware of um, certain pitfalls. And this is where programmatic knowledge uh, would be beneficial. So I use visual tools, as I've said, and um, I work through the process. This one, for example, uh, I worked through just this very simple example here, and I'm sure you could have come up with a much more efficient way or a much better way of doing these steps or these processes. 
I went through that probably four or five times before I was comfortable with the flow. And I worked through it and I worked through the scenarios in my head of how and what the user might be doing, what situations might they be in, and uh, then worked through the flow. And you can now identify your module areas and the relationships and the logic loops and the relationships that are from process to process and how we're going to step through these processes and peer view and retest and test. So give it to your uh, your 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 oppo sat on the desk next to you or give it to a, a an engineer and say this is the process that we're going to talk them through. Does this work? And, uh, you know, make sure that 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 works for you get it inside the software and then work through all of those scenarios and make sure that you do not have something that those of you who are um, who are programmatically aware is watch out for things like infinite loops. We need to be sure that we are not taking the user into a loop that just takes them round and round and round uh, because Otherwise, in that particular example that I gave you is that we might be ordering multiple power units and we don't need to. So what we can do is we could include another step or account that says, you know, have you done this? Yes. Do it again. OK, it failed. Move on to the next step. And so we can do that. So infinite loops, programmatic uh, experts out there know that much better than I do. You don't want to get lost in an infinite loop where it just takes you round and round because then you have lost the whole benefit of using something like the process data module. Slightly longer one this week, but I wanted to talk about the process data module because I am seeing now. Now, from an S1000D perspective, this has been around for a very, very long time. And, uh, you know, there's some I remember attending presentations in Clearwater probably 10, 15 years ago when the first iteration of the process data module was explained and was demonstrated by, I'll shout you out, Ryan. And, um, you know, it was it was a really good, solid presentation on the powers and the functions. And so if you want to use this and you are struggling with it, speak to your software vendors who will they, they eat and chew this stuff all day long and they'll be able to churn out processes so you visualize it in in visio or uh, diagramics if you're on mac or something along those lines give it to your uh, software programmers with all of the data module codes and all of these kind of things and get them to program it for you they'll do it really quickly some software vendors do have a drag and drop interface for creating the process data module you know uh, certainly when i was working at a software company a very long time ago now uh, we developed a drag and drop process data module interface and uh, you know so but this is very much where your uh, technical publication is now crossing the boundaries of uh, software programming. And I'm not talking about, you know, CSS and style sheets and those kind of things. We're talking about a little bit more now in terms of complexity. So that's the process data module. I'm going to do more on the process data module. Let me know if you like this and the approach to uh, presenting this. Thumbs up. It was a little bit stuttery because my monitor up there wasn't showing me exactly what I wanted to see. So I was having to do it from memory. But um, I hope you found that useful. I hope you found it uh, beneficial to you. If you want more information on the process data module, you want any of those papers that I've talked about, uh, get in touch with me. More than happy to send you some links or introduce you to some organizations that I know are supporting the process data modules for projects just like yours. And um, yeah, if you don't like the process data module, comment, send me a send me a message. Anyway, I'm Mike Ingledew. Until next week, uh, this weekend is a beautiful sunny bank holiday weekend here in the UK. I'm getting the motorcycle out. Uh, you guys stay safe and healthy wherever you are and uh, see you on the next one.